Hi guys, you're welcome to Founders Connect, the new series I started on my YouTube channel recently. We are interview the best and leading African tech entrepreneurs. On this channel, we'll see interviews with Ezra of Paystack, we'll see Nadia of Eden, Jose of Money Africa, Axel of Bitsika. And now on this video, I'm going to be interviewing the CEO of, wait, let me count it, CEO of um, Farm Crowdy, Crowdy Vest, and Plenty Worker, and also co-founder of Rents Must More, Oyinka. Hi, how are you doing? Your titles are so long. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fine. How are you doing? Very well, thank, thank you. Thank you so much for doing this with me. I really appreciate it. Oh, it's fine. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Thank you. All right, guys. So let's get into the video. Welcome to my YouTube channel. I am PC Timmy, a change maker, professional, and creative who is passionate about growing people and growing businesses. Like, comment, subscribe to my channel, and please always share my videos. It promises to always be impactful and insightful. So let's start from the early years. I was reading your blog, Oyenka.ng. I don't know if you're okay. still on it. <laughs> I found it on your Instagram. And you had the last post there was about your early years. And you talked about how you were, choir, you were leading a choir at seven. Then you were playful in secondary school. Your mom was always beating you <laughs> because you were always failing. And then how you decided in SS1 that you went to study software engineering. So can you just like talk us through your early years, like some of the things I just mentioned? Okay, um, so I am the first of five. My mm. dad is a medical doctor, um, an ONG specialist, and um, geriatrics medicine specialist as well. My mom is a civil servant. Okay. My dad was one that believed that um, you could only be successful. Initially, you could only be successful if you read your books. And so he will force us to read books. He would make us read all sorts of books. Uh, my mom, on the other hand, was the entrepreneur. My mom my mom told me when I was 12 that if I wanted to be successful, rather than reading books, she didn't say it that way, but <laughs> she didn't mention the books part. Instead, she said, I needed four streams of income. Mm. And this was me at 12. I didn't understand four streams of income. So she used the narration of um, the Guardian of Eden and said, for it to be fed properly, it needed four rivers to fill that garden. And so I think that stayed with me. And then she started trying my hands out with um, entrepreneurship. Now, in school, um, so before I started the whole entrepreneurial journey, um, I, so I, I think I was smart, um, pretty smart with my books, but I will only read 48 hours to the exam. <laughs> um, I'll play my whole life out. I was in secondary school, and I was, we used to wear trousers in mm. school then. And I was famous for having the knees, my kneecap area torn. You're always kneeling down. You're always kneeling down, <laughs> kneeling down playing counter soccer. And when it's exam time, I'll read 48 hours before. So I usually fail. If we are 50 in the class, I'll come out 45. <laughs> and so I was constantly being beaten. My mom used to say, the people that came Thursday have two heads. Um, so as this one, I decided I wanted to, I mean, what happened was I, I was in the science class and we, we had this room in school. I went to the federal government college, Sokoto. Okay. Sokoto. So you grew up in Sokoto? Um, 15 years of my life in Sokoto. Oh, wow. I was born in Lagos, and by the eighth month, my dad was transferred to the teaching hospital right. in Sokoto to head the ONG unit. So I spent 15 years of my life there. And so while I was at school, we had this room where there was a computer. Mm. And in that room was like a, imagine a three-bedroom apartment times two. Mm. And then in the middle of this room is one computer. And so once a year, you would have access to come in and see this computer, this see, holy grail. <laughs> you see it from far. I was like, whoever built this thing mm. that is so magnificent, um, what are they called? And I learned they were called computer scientists. Mm. I was just fascinated by the fact that I could create something that was so awesome. I, I, I mean, I was a child, but this was it in my head. And then I learned about Bill Gates, that he was one of the guys that was leading in that space. I tried to be like him. And so that led me into the whole software engineering phase. My dad wanted me to be a doctor. Um, we fought for about a year. If I didn't speak, um, I did my GC in SS2. I passed all the medical related courses in biology, agric, um, health science, maths and English. I failed all the engineering ones, physics, chemistry, and it was like, this is a sign. I'm like, no. <laughs> it's not. So um, after a period, he then 
allowed me read, I mean, say I wanted to do computer science, allowed me to do that. And then say, so whatever I do, I should just get my, to my doctorate. I should get my doctorate degree. So, so you have I to have the doctor title. That's right, I have the doctor title. I said, <laughs> no problem. Told me the same thing. I said, no problem, but right now we, we've settled that matter. <laughs> <laughs> we can't do that. So, I mean, those were my green years. And then I got into school and um, did um, um, software engineering eventually in an Indian university oh, okay. called Sikkim Manipal University. Um, while I was in school, I, I, I focused on web design in my first years. I did a lot of things with websites. Mm -hmm. um, I did websites where, um, I've said this a couple of times, I did websites where I'm told to do a presentation in class, and rather than doing a PowerPoint presentation, I'll do a website. I was that fast and good in designing websites. Wow. And I, had, I did websites to the point that I want to talk to a lady, and rather than talking to her directly, <laughs> I'll create a website for her, and I'll Smooth. send her the website URL, <laughs> and it always worked. <laughs> And so Very I had, smooth. by the time I was done with school, I had maybe like 10 different <laughs> ladies' websites I created. And so good portfolio, though. Uh, it was a good portfolio, exactly. Because <laughs> when I was done, when I kept on pitching to get web design, they kept asking, why do you have a lot of ladies? I said they were models. So I had to create websites. There was this modeling company I had to do websites <laughs> for. So I did that. Um, did a lot with websites. Got out of school. I didn't realize that I had a first class for... You didn't realize? No, I didn't. And that's the truth. I mean, because uh, everybody that was around me, my first friend, I, I had come back, I was working. I, I just came back within a week. I was looking for what? something to do right. because the pressure on my family became mm. intense. My dad was struggling with the whole paying school fees in private school for my younger ones. Mm. So I designed websites to the point where websites, w there was a website I designed that allowed me to pay for my last school fees oh. um, using that. So I, I found out that I could create okay. something that could help. So I wanted to quickly start working. I had four younger sisters. Um, I wanted to quickly start working so I could raise money to, mm. to ease the burden on my family. So I wasn't really paying attention to waiting for whether the results were out. I just went on first week, I got out of school. In fact, my, after my last paper, got out of school, came in, I started pitching to people in church. So you moved back to Nigeria immediately? So the thing is, I didn't do the program in India. Okay. I did the program here. Okay. Um, so I was already, I was still on ground in Nigeria. Right. Um, so I just a week after the exam, I started pitching to people and I got a job. I got a job to design websites for a particular software company. Um, and then my career started going on from, from that point. So I started creating websites. Um, I, I eventually got another job in Abuja and then a contract job in Abuja to create animations for university um, pr um, for secondary school curriculums. Okay. And so it was while I was doing that job, my mom called me and she was like, ah, blah, 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 um, some results came in and this, this, that. I said, oh, okay. Say, so, yeah, you had a first class. I was like, eh. <laughs> so, okay. I didn't, I didn't realize that. And um, so that was humbling. Mm. And I was grateful to God for that. But I didn't really use, I didn't dwell on yeah. that i just focused on what i could do with my hands yeah. really quick and i was in a hurry to make sure i ease the burden on my family so those were my early years before the whole entrepreneurial journey i went on to work for some corporates lots of companies yes, <laughs> let me list it out for you guys you worked for wakano yeah. city bank british council um travel better jumia conga and Did Deloitte. I miss Deloitte. And Deloitte. <laughs> How? Okay, so let me ask the question this way, right? Yeah. How did this opportunities? Because these are companies that even till now, and this is that you started working around 2006, 2007. Yes, yes. And so even now, 10 years down the line, these are companies that people are still hustling to work for. So how did you get these opportunities? And how did you, what made you move at different times? So okay, you know what? I want to move from Jumia and I want to go to this other company. Like, how did it happen? So you know the first I one was in 2007. British Council. Mm. I got in and I was their webmaster for Nigeria. While I was there, I discovered that it wasn't just good enough to design a website. You needed to create um, a way for people to know that that website existed. Mm. And that was what introduced me to digital marketing right. um, or online marketing. That was what it was called then. Um, so I started studying online marketing and then I met someone that introduced me to a platform called LinkedIn. This was 2008. And so I created my LinkedIn profile 
and then I started studying on online marketing. Mm. And it was later on, uh, in 20, 2009, that I discovered that there were only two people in Nigeria that had on their profile on LinkedIn that they understood online marketing. Wow. At that time. Wow. So <laughs> I... I is saturated. <laughs> and now everybody is doing it, you know. Um, so I, um, 2009, there was the recession. British Council was um, shrinking its um, efforts with staff and then some people had to leave. Mm. I wanted to leave. So I used my profile to pitch um, to a couple of organizations and then Deloitte um, was interested in my service. Right. So that's Deloitte brought me in to become their e-marketing coordinator for West, East and Central Africa, about six countries wow. that I was handling their web presence, about 18 websites then. So I joined Deloitte from British, British Council in 2009. When I got in there, I wasn't so um, satisfied with with what I was getting because I thought I was going to do more on the online marketing bit, but I was doing mm. more on the web management bit. Oh. Um, so it was a good place to work in, but I was putting my eyes out there for opportunities around um, um, online marketing bit. I then just kept on doing my job. So I gave a hundred, and this is something that I'm very happy about. I can go back to British Council today. And I'm treated like family. Same yeah. in Deloitte and in all the organizations I've worked in. Because I gave 120%. Mm. So my 9 to 5, I give 120. Then when I go back home, I do the to things do I love. Yeah. So I did that in Deloitte. And then LinkedIn again. Um, the, a team reached out to me in Wakanda. I actually, we're still very good friends. Myself and the lady that recruited me to Wakanda. Oh. <laughs> still very good. She's now based in London. Um, she reached out to me and said, Oh, they're recruiting for a firm called Wakana. Now, if it was a Nigerian that called me, I wouldn't take that <laughs> call seriously. Because I was like, what, what the heck is Wakana? And this was 2009 into 2010. And, and she was like, oh, it's, a, it's an online travel company like Expedia. Mm. And they're trying to build an Expedia for Nigeria. I said, okay. And then we got talking, and um, I understood that the opportunity was going to give me two things. One okay. was I was going to learn online marketing, now, from a guy that was part of the Obama campaign in pushing the Obama, Obama campaign in the US, I was going to um, mentor under him. I was going to oh. have him as a mentor that would guide me. That was one. Two was the salary was really good. <laughs> <laughs> like the way you said it. The salary was, it was 3x what I was earning in Deloitte. I was going to get a car and a driver. And it was my first time working in a startup. Right. So I was excited about it. And then I took the offer. I talked Wait, to the team. Why did you want to learn digital market, online marketing so bad? Was it because you realized that there were only two people and you could dominate the space? Or because you just found that you were more interested in it than the web development you're already doing? I was more interested in it because mm -hmm. this was 2009. I had just won, I just come to the international web design competition. And that was the first time I met a sitting president, um, President Goodluck. He gave, me, uh, he gave me, I mean, I won a cash prize, then I used it to buy a car. Um, it was a very good time, but I had said to myself that I was going to stop. I had designed about 400 websites at that time. Wow. But I wanted to stop the web design part and focus on the online marketing bit. Um, that was just the That's drive. Okay. I wanted to learn online marketing. Um, so, so got, Wakana got into Wakanda and started off with Wakanda. Six months into it, launched the first online marketing campaign heavily in Wakanda. And it was a huge success. And the venue just went off the roof. Um, it was an exciting time. We moved from about a million a day to eight million a day. Wow. In, uh, on Naira or dollars? Naira. Okay. Naira. <laughs> and this was March. March it was exactly was March 8, 2011. Wow. And Same. it was quite ago. exciting for us to, to see that happen. So <coughs> that put me in that space where I was excited that finally understanding online marketing yeah. at this time, I was able to do my own work in the company and see the impact really happen. So 2011, at the same time, I was now trying to figure out what exactly am I going to do with myself? I'm, mm. uh, where do I go from here? Um, but you already, you already had a car and two eggs. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, it wasn't about the car for me at this time. I was, I was trying to make a decision because what I had done was I, I set certain goals for myself before then, and I was achieving them long before the dates I had set for, the, for those goals to be achieved. So I, I was asking, okay, what's the next thing? Mm. Now, 
I think it's a problem when you find yourself skillful in a lot of things, you then struggle with which one you want to focus, focus on. on. I think it's easier when you have talent in one thing. Yeah. And so this was a major problem for me at this time. I asked for the audience with a mentor of mine then, um, Victor Kibo, mm. and I went to meet him to say, I wanted to go through my career as a person and ask him to advise me on what, what I was going to do myself. And when we went through the process, that he put me through at his place. I then saw that I had strength in the tech side, so I could either be a CTO mm. um, with my tech background, or I could be a CMO with my marketing, marketing background. Not necessarily the background now, but the, the, the interest right. in marketing right. and what I had done over right. the time. Because I was in more on coding and programming side, yeah. um, prior to the web, web marketing side, um, than I was doing on the marketing side. But I love the marketing bit. So I went back to and said, okay, I want to be a CMO. And then when I'm done with that, I want to build my own business. And so we established the fact that first I wanted to be a CMO. So okay. how do I become one? I went back to LinkedIn. <laughs> and I checked out the people that were CMOs at that time. I checked the guy that was the CMO in MTN. Uh, these were the companies we were looking out to at that time and saying, okay, I want to be like him. I checked the CMO in Airtel. So I checked the courses they did. I checked the things they had done at that time. I checked the future of what a CMO should look like. Mm. And then I understood that it wasn't just going to be the, your strength in online marketing that will help alone. I needed to learn offline marketing. Right. And I needed to learn how to communicate with the media, the PR side of things. So I established that fact. The second thing I established with him was um, I found out that looking at Nigeria, this was 2011, um, there were several sectors that needed technology to uh, um, have an impact on. And for me, I saw three of them as one, that, as the ones that I wanted to focus on. Um, one was agriculture, two was real estate, and three was transportation. And at this time I said, if anyone uses technology in those spaces, you would have tremendous impact. I mean, you create value and then you create wealth, but you have tremendous impact on so many people's lives. Right. Um, so those were the two things I established that. Eventually, I'm going to do businesses in these three mm. sectors with Victor. I established that. And then, but now, I wanted to focus on being a CMO. CMO. And I wanted to be a CMO by 30. Uh, that was the mark. I said, I must be the CMO of a company, not just any company, a company that is known all over <laughs> the country. And so those were my And how old were you then? Um, this was 2011. I was, um, what, 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 what? I was um, 25, 26. Oh. 25, 26 at that time. Um, so I started working on that and looking out for those opportunities. So 2012, um, I, I still continued doing some website designings, like I said I was doing. And I um, created a website called Divas and Blokes. It was an e-commerce platform <coughs> for people to buy um, clothes online. Right. So the ladies who buy and the guys who buy, I called two of my friends that had boutiques. One had boutiques for men and the other had boutiques for ladies. Took pictures of their stuff, put it on the website. And wanted people to buy stuff online. This was March 2012. Mm. Um, April 2012, I then started researching who had done this online. And I saw a website called Zando in South Africa. And um, I reached out to the owners, Rocket Internet. Mm. I said, hey, you guys are doing this in South Africa. I see you're doing a good job. I sent it to them on LinkedIn and then, um, and uh, Mano Kosa. And I was saying, can you guys come and try this out in Nigeria? Um, and they responded to me. I sent it by 7 p.m. that day. Around 12 at night, they responded to me and said, hey, we're already in Nigeria. We're trying to do something like that. Can we meet at four points the next day? I said, wow. okay, fantastic. <laughs> I'm ready. And then I went for the meeting. And Mano was sitting somewhere, then there was Leo Stigler that was sitting somewhere else. And so I just met these three German guys and they said, oh, they want to build the Amazon for Nigeria. Um, and so they're recruiting people now, will I be interested? I said, yeah, but you have to acquire my company. <laughs> like, acquire a company. Like, yeah, I told them, yes, I have a startup. <laughs> they said, I thought <laughs> you said you were working website. in Wakanda. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I work in Wakanda, but I also have a startup. <laughs> I was running. They said, oh, okay, what's the URL? I sent them, I gave them the URL. I said, go check, check it out. 
said, oh, okay, so you, you're doing e-commerce for fashion. I said, yeah, I'm doing e-commerce for fashion. I've not sold one. <laughs> Just one website. Website. <laughs> website. I was like, yeah, that's the start of it. Like, okay, okay. So we had a conversation. It moved from just coming as an employee, and then it made me a director. And did they and acquire the company? No, they didn't. Acquire okay. This company. Eventually, I didn't even. I, I found out there were so many things I didn't know. Right. I was just, I was just having fun <laughs> and, <laughs> and, experimenting. and experimenting, and then trying and shooting my shot. <laughs> and but eventually, we they they brought me in as a director, and. What I was supposed to do was to help register the business in Nigeria. So they had two arms. They had one they called Kasua and the other one they called Sabunta. Hmm. And so I was in the fashion arm because of the website I showed yeah. them. So Leo said, oh, you wanted to establish this fashion arm. And that some other guys were establishing the, the Kasua arm. But I didn't know the guys then. Okay. Um, so I joined Leo. And then I went back to Wakana and said I wanted to leave. And they're like, oh, you're not leaving. You can't leave, blah, 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 blah. We're building this. I said, no, but the opportunity now I have where I'm going, it's going to now give me that offline marketing experience, right. beyond the online marketing experience. And that takes you closer and to That CMO. takes me closer back to where I want to get to yeah. as a CMO. So after several negotiations with Wakana, I eventually resigned. I left the car, I left the driver. I took a pay cut. Mm. I took a pay cut that uh, moved me roughly about, I took about, 45% of my salary wow. to take that the opportunity. and But everybody that asked me at that time to avoid stories, I just told them all it was the higher salary. Mm. So I admit, you don't ask me questions and it doesn't look like I'm stupid doing yeah. what I'm doing. Um, so I joined Leo and we started off in one, 1004 and um, we started recruiting the first set of people. I remember we created um, Pay As You Go, I'm sorry, uh, Pay, pay. I mean, when you pay, um, when they bring the item to you, and then you pay okay. um, on the spot. We created a lot of things, <coughs> and we launched Sabunta, and we created the first set of people with Leon Sabunta. Turned out I was the first Nigerian in the team. Every right. other person were people that came from that were doing maybe their internship, and so MBA grads that were coming in to just get three months into the business. Um, so we started out Sabunta, and then it grew really fast. I cut my teeth on how to draw. I created what was, I had what was maybe the first time I would really, I j just something that I was under pressure. Mm. Three days into it, Leo said, if I don't launch the business in the next 72 hours, I was going to lose my job. I had oh, resigned wow. where I came <laughs> from. And, and so I was under pressure. And then I created, I had 500,000 there. And I went to um, Bogobiri. I had conversations with them, said I wanted to use that place for an event. Um, I called media people. I told them I was going to give them lunch. So that was all I could afford. But I wanted them to come and hear the new Amazon that was about to launch. Right. And so maybe that was the first press um, Conference ev event had. that I had. <laughs> I brought people in. And they came in, and then I talked to them about the idea. And Leo talked to them about the idea. And it took off from there. Mm. Um, I, from 500,000, we started doing sales of 5 million, started doing sales of 10 million. It's very growing. Um, we then raised some more money and then got an office in, um, in Lekki Phase 1. And then when we got that office, um, we then understood that there was going to be a merge between both companies. Okay. So it's Kasua then merged with Sabunta and it became Jumia. Right. So that's what became uh, gave birth to Jumia. Um, so I was there for a bit, then I left. Um, I, I, I think I left because um, I wasn't generally satisfied with some of the culture I was experiencing mm. at that time. I mean, it's a fantastic place now to <laughs> walk in, but at that time it was there was a lot of emphasis on speed, speed, and so people were hitting people, just get it done anyhow, push. And I was coming from a place where in British Council where yeah. family was all chilled. <laughs> So I, at that point, I left um, and then took up a gig in GTD for about three months. But before I left, I met my um, co-founder of one of my one of the startups that I eventually later launched, Quickgest. Okay. Um, that's Pelumi. That's Pelumi. Yeah. So Pelumi, <laughs> the way I met Pelumi was, so they retired the entire tech team in one day after they emerged both websites. Oh wow! And so Pelumi was saying I at this time I was thinking of how to create quick chest 
but its name wasn't quick just then. I was just thinking about to create a website that aggregates content from different places for people. So Kwedemi was saying, <laughs> it was on the other end of the table, and he said, I beg, make I just go and, let me just go and, sorry, let me speak. <laughs> 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 <That's fine. laughs> let me just go and um, create, let me go and focus on creating media websites for all these media outlets. And I was like, oh, okay, what have you done? And he said, oh, I had created the Guardian app. And he showed it to me. I was like, fantastic. I'm trying to do something like this. Mm. I was like, oh, he did it. Yeah, and no. he just did it on the side. I was like, okay, let's do something like this. And um, he spent like four days in my apartment. And we created Quickest. In four days? Yeah, in four days. I did the front end. He did the back end. Right. And um, I, I did the, all the UI UX. And he did all the coding at the back. And then in four days, we came up with the app. And six weeks later, we had 200,000 people downloaded the app. It shocked us to our bones. And, and so we kept on, we pushed that on the side. But I took on a gig with GTB to help launch uh, the social banking app, the GT mobile money app. Um, um, I was part of the, um, the e-commerce platform that GTB had um, at that SME time. SME Market Hub. Market Hub. So I was part of the team to help launch that. Then Sim Shagaya found out that I had left Jumia. And they reached out to me and said he wanted me to come to Conga to help build a marketing team for them. In my negotiation with Sim, I ended up landing a role as a VP of marketing in Conga. <laughs> so I eventually landed that opportunity that I was aiming for um, at 30 when I was 27. Wow. So I was Three like, years okay. Early. Yes. I was like, okay, um, let's do this. I got into Conga. It was fantastic. Um, it was fantastic building the team from scratch. It was a very good environment to work in. I had lots of friends. There are people that I worked with in Congo that are now working with me in my companies. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, so you push them back? Um, not this year. <laughs> the relationship was there. It wasn't right. a coaching team. Some of them had left okay. and gone to do others, but we've reunited now. Some of them left there, went to work, and went to Jumia, went to travel, better, travel start, and then now we're working together in Farm Crowdy. So I built really good relationships mm. with people there. It was a fantastic, fantastic time working. And then the results were also showing. We launched um, the four Yakata sales, mm. Black Friday sales, yep. um, 2013. It was a very good time with the team. And then I decided that, okay, let me now become my own entrepreneur. Ah, right. So just before we get there, so you were doing quick gist while you were in, in Jitsi Bank and Conga. Mm. So it was just side business. It was just it was running, just also on, running yes, on its own. Yes. Interesting. But I saw on your LinkedIn that before quick gist, like I think before, um, there was one part where you had this company called Anuzin. So Anuzin was my the web design company oh, where I did right. all 400 websites I had done on my own. Right. Yeah. So that was just the design design company. Um, right. so, so why I, didn't you ever do quick gist like full time? So yeah, I wanted to, and I did. Okay. I resigned right. from Conga, okay. took 50K dollars from Chikawobi, mm. and then said I was going to run quick just full time. I told Penumi, time of Penumi didn't come with me. <laughs> <laughs> I told Penumi, come, let's go and do this thing together. <laughs> and like everybody, uh, all hands on deck, let's get this done. Six months later, I was using my rent money, my savings, my- It failed. It, it was a- Total disaster. But usually, you take VC and angel money so that you can. So what it happened? It was a lot of learning. It was, it was one of those moments. I, I mean, one of the darkest times of my life was in mm. that period. Also, after it failed, mm. I went through crazy times. But what happened? What made it fail? And maybe lessons for people. Yes, please. One was, um, Quick Gist was a social news aggregator. It allowed us to get people to. I like stories from maybe Bella Niger, I like stories from Guardian, I like stories from Forbes. So I take all those sources and I put it in the app mm. for it to aggregate content on a daily basis and serve it to me as my own personalized newspaper, mm. right? That was what people liked about Quick Gist. As soon as right. I raised money, I said, let's go and create our own content. And I think that was the first disaster. I didn't realize how expensive it was to create, create your, your own content. content. Right. So rather than aggregating content, we started creating premium content. 
and in creating content, I was trying to compete with Sound City. I was trying to compete with <laughs> with any other platform that was out there that was giving the best. I wanted the best. So I was spending money on equipment. I was spending money on getting yeah. the right arts. I was spending money on editing because I wanted to create content. And so recruited the team of 13, started off. Like 13 or 13 just people, like that? Like I recruited in one month, I had 13 people. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was, it was I, you know, when you raise money, um, people make mistakes. They raise money and then all of a sudden, pops as the light bulb and mm. you think you can now become Albert Einstein. You want to do 60 mm. things at once. So, yeah. It's important to focus. Mm. The reason why you raise money especially from investors, for them to see you s scale, scale on that, that one thing that is, mm. that is key for you, that got you to that point. Mm. Um, let every other team come out of it and be ostrich. Not that you go and you just Add pull things. So I was pulling so many things in and we finished the money and the business wasn't generating enough revenue to sustain it. I started using my savings. I started using all the money I had on me I remember when I even used my house rent and then moved the team to my <laughs> to house. house. The landlord one day passed and said, ah, Unika, I've noticed that your car, you've been parking it <laughs> outside consistently. You don't go to the <laughs> office again. I said, oh, no, we're fine. I said, well, in my head, I was like, why is this man asking me today that I use the, <laughs> the rent money to pay <laughs> salaries? Like, is today this man <laughs> will come and ask no. me this question. So it was crazy and Eventually, what then happened was when I knew that we had hit rock bottom, I had a chat with Chika. Uh, Chika was a fantastic, and he's still a mentor for me today. Mm. He's a fantastic guy to have as a mentor. He had a conversation with me. He made me realize my mistakes, and but it was already a bit too late. Right. So um, the option was sell this business. So I started looking for someone that would acquire the team because I didn't. Mm. There were p good people in the team. Some of them I had to let go, but there were good people in the team that I wanted on to continue Appreciate working in other places. And so we eventually did that. Uh, we got Guardian um, Business Day and um, um, at that time City People to take up different oh, people in the sweet. team. They started earning maybe two x what they were earning oh. with me. So that was I was happy okay. about that. And then we got some deals with those companies. So I. What that we did was we, we looked at the websites we are aggregating content from and saw that there were some of them that didn't really look nice. Okay. And they could do more with the revenue they were generating from adverts. So I designed, redesigned their websites myself mm -hmm. and then took it to them and said, hey, your website can look like this one and two, you can make this yeah. kind of money with it. Right. And so it became something mm. that was attractive to a lot of these um, um, newspaper companies. So we designed Guardian, we designed Business Day, we designed um, city people, city people. Um, and then had the team work there. That was what saved me hmm. eventually. Um, so I took time off and I wanted to learn from my mistakes. I was trying to learn from all the things I had gone through. Um, then she kind of introduced me to a group of guys that I wanted to start travel better. And that was how that's how I got to travel better. So I, I, <laughs> I did do my first startup and it didn't work out the way I thought it would. Right. But well, you're doing four now. So let's, let's, let's get there. Um, so it was from Travel Better that you went to Farm Crowdy. Yeah. Um, how did the idea for Farm Crowdy come? Cause it's like it was the first agri tech business in Nigeria, right? Uh, maybe not the first agri tech business. Maybe the first um, ag agri tech business focused on crowdfunding. Um, yes. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. like, how did you come about the idea, and how did you start? How did you get your co-founders? Like, what's the Farm Crowdy story? Um, so 2015, I went to speak at the international ICT conference in Abuja. Mm. And a couple of people came from all over the country. And there was this Chinese guy that came. He was at that time the MD of, of um, the largest, the third largest solar company in the world. Mm. And he was the MD for Africa. So he came to speak also in the event. So I spoke, I spoke around tech. And then he told the organizers he wanted to have a chat with me. So we go talking. This was October 2015. And he told me about things that were happening in China. Mm. And one of it, he said he wanted to just, he just had the knowledge to share with me and see if there's anything I think Nothing can be like done that. in the Nigerian space. So he shared one around how people get to the airports and if your flight is delayed, there's an app that allows you to register um, how much time is delayed. And then um, over time, the flights, flights are held accountable and they will pay, pay you 
Um, so you keep accumulating points for the delays and then nice. I said, like, okay, this will work, but <laughs> I wasn't really nice. sure about yeah. that yet. Um, so he told me about that. Then he told me about another one I can't remember now, but the third one was um, a platform called eMobile. Mm. And what he said was people were using a mobile app to own ships. Mm. Ships in ship being um, 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 so lamps uh, and goods right. and ship. So and for the for the ship, what happens is if I own a ship, when they wool it and they sell the wool, I make money. Make mo right. So people were excited about doing this on their phones. And I'm like, okay, interesting. I then told the media, so instead of doing ships here, we do it in cassava. Mm. And um, November of that year, he flew into Ghana. So I went to Ghana to go and meet him. And I, before this, I told him to research the Imabao platform so he can understand, because it was in Chinese and I didn't really understand a lot of what they were saying. Yeah. So he translated that for me and um, I understood the platform better. And so after our meeting, I got back to Lagos and in January of 2016, I reached out to my first co-founder, Ifai. How many are you guys? How many co-founders? Um, so there are five of us. Five? Yeah, there are five of us. Um, myself, Topware. Topware now is the MD of Crowd Invest. Mm -hmm. um, Akindele, Ifai, and um, Christopher. Okay. So I reached out to Ifai first, and I said, um, I want to do this, and um, I want you to join me. And he, he immediately took him 24 hours to decide. Wow. And then he was like, okay, let's get it done. I told him, okay, I needed farmers. So he got some farmers for me. If I is like the chief connecting officer <laughs> for, for us. Uh, you tell him you need this person, he gets it. Person. Gets it. So he got the farmers in. And I started understanding the pain point of millions of farmers in Nigeria, okay. access to phony, technical knowledge, and then where to sell what they produce. Right. Um, so that gave birth to understanding that, okay, so if I'm going to build a platform that will solve this problem, and I had to find how to get the money, Mm -hmm. And then to find the market to sell, mm. and then to find how to train the guys. Performance. So that led me to recruiting the other set of people that joined me. So Christopher, now Christopher was easy for me to get because Christopher has been my chief conspiration. He's been <laughs> my, that person that if I want to get the mischie chief mischievous <laughs> officer, if I want to get stuff done. When I said I was doing websites for ladies in school, he was he was the one doing the back end for me, <laughs> <laughs> and. Um, so we've been friends for, for going to 17 years now. Wow. And uh, so I called him and said, hey, I want to do this. Ah, yeah, no problem. At this time, he was the um, head of um, IT in Bayasa State okay. Government House. And so he was doing his work for me. We'll fly into Lagos. So I'll he was drive acting to Lagos. as CTO? As CTO. Okay. Then Akindele, um, uh, Akindele as our CFO. Um, I got Akindele in to help with the financial side. Mm -hmm. And then um, there was one other co-founder that was, that was but left later on who was supposed to handle operations. Mm. Um, so all of us came together and started off. Topware joined us just before we launched in right. September. She joined in August okay. um, to double for that other operational. Co um, operational side of the business that the other co-founder was handling. So that was how we question. started. Did you have, I mean, because most times when people are starting tech platforms, they look for maximum three founders, mm. right? But you have you have five. Mm. That's split equity five ways <laughs> already. Everybody has twenty percent or something yeah. like that. But like, did you have any issues with it? Was did that make it hard for to raise money at any point? I think there's no hard on rule that it must be three or five or ten mm. or two or one. I think for me, initially they weren't referred to as co-founders. Right. Um, I was the sole founder. But I noticed that one when I was setting out build the company. I didn't want to go into it alone. So from the onset, they had equity. But I didn't call them co-founders, but they had equity oh, right. already in the business for their sweat, for their time. So I give them equity in the business. But when we were launching, I noticed that people were focused more on who is the founder. I'm like, okay, but this guy can also give you as much knowledge as yeah. I would give you. Yeah. So immediately I had a conversation. I said, guys, <laughs> I'm going to have to refer to you guys as co-founders with me. And you already have equity in the business. So, so it's, it, made it's it made sense to call you co-founders. And that reduced the pressure mm. and focus on me. So, and those are lessons I learned from QuickGist. Because mm. there are a lot of things I did alone with QuickGist. This time around, I wasn't going to do anything alone. And it's been the, the, the way I've operated in all the all other startups. I don't 
want to do any business or I, I mean all business I've done I always have a team of people around me. Um, concerning equity it wasn't a um, rule that we should split it all the same right. across board. Um, I was able to manage that even when we were setting up the business right. so um, and everybody was fine with that and everybody's still on but apart from the operations guy that left three months into the project mm. um, all of five of us have still been on it and we're still driving, okay. driving what has been the biggest challenge at from crowdy in the last four years i think when the first guy left um he was the one we're depending on to do everything as it concerns the agriculture side of mm. the business somebody else was doing the tech side i was putting my eyes there but i was doing marketing and business development mm. somebody else was doing finance when he left in building an ag tech platform and you don't have an agri expert in the team it was a huge disaster for us that mm. first three months mm. into it you know, so by the third month when he was leaving i think that was a major challenge so all of us then had to roll our sleeves off and became farmers <laughs> I had literally had to start getting into the farms. I had to start meeting the farmers. I had to start learning from scratch. And this time around, you're not learning and take, you have the luxury of time to learn. Have you, to. We have to do it really fast. Um, that was a major challenge. Two was, <laughs> I remember pitching the idea of Farm Crowdy to a group of investors, and they told me I was joking. Um, they said, with my experience in the e commerce space in Jumina and Conga, um, in travel, in Wakana, in travel <laughs> better. Um, so I carry all that knowledge. Then I have a <laughs> I first <laughs> class in technology, and in, in software engineering, and it's spam. <laughs> I'm going to go and put on. So they, they, they labeled me a joke. So I couldn't raise money easily. Wow. Um, eventually, when we got into Techstars Atlanta, I thought that even getting into the accelerator program will help us help. do that even better. But I had to pitch to about 82 investors. 82 of them um, for me though it was a good experience because every time I got better with the pitch yeah. and I can wake up tomorrow and see de deliver that That's first pitch <laughs> <laughs> um, eventually we raised a million dollars and that helped us stabilize things within the first quarter and then people started paying more attention to us a lot of copycats then came up all of a sudden uh, I see the thing now is that once you once you raise money in any business, the only way you won't get copycat, don't announce. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you announce, don't even see the amount. But a lot of copycats just sprang up all over the place. At one time, we were maybe two or three. All of a sudden, it became like 35. <laughs> I like, okay. And, um, but that didn't affect the business and the growth in any way, did it? We had our vision intact. We knew what we were building. We knew what we were doing. And every other person was imitating us. So mm. we kept on staying ahead of the curve kept on being the front runners mm. and and that's been exciting we we even when we moved away from crowdfunding for agriculture people didn't even realize that we had stopped crowdfunding for agriculture on farm crowd and created a new crowdfunding platform in crowd invest. and so people didn't realize that before they the, everyone took so note you of say that you thing. stopped crowdfunding agriculture mm. so what is farm crowd still doing now so now farm crowd is focused on using technology in providing farmers with um, access to finance goes beyond crowdfunding finance. Right. There's finance from the banks, there's finance from state governments, there's the finance from large donors. It can still get that for the farmers, and it gets that even in larger chunks than if we were doing the crowdfunding. Right. It's a lot more patient capital. You can get finance that can stay with you for five years as against crowdfunding that will need the sponsor paid back in three months or six right. months. So it's now a B2B business from the B2C. It is more of a B2B business. So there's that part. There's also the marketplace part. There's the part that gives the farmers more than just finance. They get insurance covers. Um, they get market assets, they get trainings. And so all of that is now an ecosystem that is built on tech. Mm. Um, and so that is mm. th that allowed us to also scale. Yeah. Uh, because as soon as we did that, we moved from working with 2,000 farmers to 8 to 25,000. Now we have about 360,000. a larger pool of funds yeah. coming in. Yeah, and we're able to work with more farmers. Farmers within our network currently sits around 360,000 of them. So we're able to grow, grow really with fast. tech. And 
it's allowing us to scale our operations a lot faster. Did you do that before or after the pandemic? Before or oh, when? way before. We did, that in, right. we did that in July 2019. So when the pandemic came, it didn't really affect the way yes. it affected So people orders. kept asking, why, how is it that you guys are surviving? So you, uh, <laughs> you don't know we've left, left this. You know, we also launched um, um, Farm Crowded Foods mm -hmm. during the pandemic. So people were ordering for raw food items to be delivered to their homes. During the pandemic, it was fantastic business for us because people couldn't move. Yeah. And all of a sudden, people were using their mobile apps to order for rice, for gari, for beans, and it gets delivered to their houses. And it's still running. That's running. It's, it, the pandemic allowed us to build that MVP and it became a full-blown business. And we're excited about the numbers we're getting from there. Amazing. So what does Crowdinvest now do? Like, how does it work? It seems like you took what from Crowdinvest to Crowdinvest. But yeah. Can you explain? So Crowdinvest allows sponsors now sponsor or invest in different opportunities, not just in agriculture. Right, so in individual sponsors still. Yes, individual sponsors. They can invest in agri opportunities, real estate, transportation, health, education opportunities. They can also save their money on the platform if they want to um, and get better interest rates than they will do um, with um, other institutions that do something. So would you say it's playing in the same space as the other fintechs? Um, yeah, it's Crowdinvest is a fintech platform. Right. Yeah. Crowdinvest is a fintech platform. So, that was accidental. Though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you're because going to count now. Yeah, right? because you're so, is it agriculture, transportation, it's, it's and real estate? Those are my focus. <laughs> and that's why, also, I mean, you, when you restart, you said I, I'm not the CEO per se of Crowdinvest. Right. I am Tucker leads Crowdinvest as the managing director. Mm. I stay at the board level giving oversight. Mm. So she's account. doing CEO uh, from Crowdy. No, she's she focused moved? exclusively on Crowdinvest. She's right. not involved in anything in Farm Crowdy any longer. Um, so we've been able to um, have that part of the business run um, separately. I still keep my eyes on those three things uh, being agriculture with Farm Crowdy. Um, rent small, small, the real estate, and then plenty work out. So let's talk plenty work out just before we start rounding up. Yeah. Um, so plenty work out started in 2018, if I'm correct? No, last year. Last year. Uh, 2020? Actually, or 2019? September 2019. September 2019. So you, it was in 2011 you said you were going to focus on agriculture, transport, and uh, stuff. Real estate, yeah. So how did you know that it was time for, for plenty, plenty work out? Um, so most of the opportunities that I've started. Um, have come from personal problems. Mm. Apart from maybe farm crowdy that was this conversation with the Chinese guy. Mm. Um, um, with Plenty Worker, I flew in from Qatar from an event and I had to be in flower mills. This was January 2019. Um, I got into Nigeria around 8.15 and I had to be in flower mills in a meeting by 10. Right. So I left my things in the car and I had the driver, I had the driver take that. I had to take two bikes from the airport, the international airport, to get to our papa. Uh, I got into the meeting. My other co-founders came, but he used the boot. Mm. So he got to CMS and used the boot over the lagoon. We finished the meeting, and they said, let's take the boot back to CMS. I said, ah, this is fantastic. So today I used the plane. <laughs> I, I tweeted about it. It's, not, I, I'm, it's good I tweeted because it's, it's something I can ref reference yeah. in the future. I said, I used the plane. I've used the bike, I'm using the boat. <laughs> what more can you get? I mean, the life of an entrepreneur in Lagos. So we used the boat, went back to CMS. Then the shocker. We got to CMS and they said, as I said, okay, let's take Uber. I said, no, let's take the bus. I'm like, eh? <laughs> <laughs> like, no, let's, let's take the bus. But when last did you take the bus? I said, I can't remember. I mean, don't get me wrong. There was a time, me, there wasn't much difference between me and the bus conductor. Mm. We drag for change together. Mm. But... I hadn't taken one in a while. Yeah. Instead of taking a bus, I'll take a bike. And uh, yeah, let's try it. So eventually, the only way they convinced me was, okay, we'll pay for all the seats in the bus. Mm. So we got a bus from CMS. Those Volkswagen buses that can take about 14, 15 passengers when they should be taking only 10 yeah. or 9. And we got into the bus and we're driving to our office in Oniru. And I sat in front. And all of them sat at the back and they were laughing. But they were giggling, but they didn't say anything. So we were just taking pictures. <laughs> I was holding the edge <laughs> of the door. And I didn't realize how scared I was mm. about getting into that bus. All of a sudden, I could see all the metals. I remember when I used to get into the bus, I didn't care. Yeah. But at this time, I was seeing all the metals. Like, this in TSB now, anti tetanus injection. And like, the sweat, the driver was just going. We're going through the traffic and the heat. I was. So, 
we got to the office and they were laughing. I took pictures I like ah, today, so I updated my tweets. I haven't gone into the bus. But then that night, I called Johnny, mm. who is my co-founder and friends Maka, and I told him, I said, "Come here." So people will go to the office in the morning. They wear white shirts and mm. wear red tie, and this is how they get to the office if they can't spend money on Uber every day. Yeah, I was like, "Man, this thing is crazy." We're like, we have to change this. We have to find something here. Yeah. And Johnny at this time had been on my case that I should come and invest in his startup. The startup was focused on getting Keke, the tricycles, yeah. on the road. I told him I wasn't going to invest because Kekes keep scratching <laughs> my car. There's no way I will invest <laughs> in something that will be scratching more of my car. So at that time, I told him, hey, let's, let's think of something. Yeah, so he came to my house the next morning. And we started brainstorming. How do we get buses on the road mm. um, that are better? than what I experienced the, day, the night before, the day before. And so we said bring on that. It took, me, it took us about three weeks. One of the things I like doing is when I have an idea, quickly I want to get a name. <laughs> I want to get a name. So Why? I just enjoy that process of getting a name. I'm usually focused on the name. Once I have a name and I can name it, then yeah, everything it starts building around right. it. So it, within a week, we came up with the name Plenty Waka. I considered High Dam for, I considered so many other names, but Plenty Waka. And I picked Plenty Waka case. Um, I mean, the Waka is, Waka represents movement, movement in Pigeon. Yeah. So Plenty Movement. And we came up with a name, and then we started working our way on that idea. Um, so this was January, September. We came up with the app and then went live. Um, we went live in the first one month, we're moving like eight people a day. Mm. Um, the next month we're moving like 30, 40 people a day, but we kept at it. Uh, just before the pandemic, we got to a point where we're moving about 2,000 people a day. A day. Wow. And um, I mean, the pandemic came, hit us hard. Um, when it hit us hard, <laughs> when there was no money again, we moved all the seats from the buses. I started using the buses for logistics. <laughs> And then, <laughs> as soon as the pandemic, as soon as they allow people to start moving again, you put back the seats. seats. Back. <laughs> because money had to come. I, like, I, I was just looking at these buses in the house, in the, I mean, in the, in the offices uh, with the drivers and the partners. Um, but now it's getting back to that, and we're excited about it. I mean, we d we've moved about um, close to 300,000 people in, in, wow, in, the first, in the first 14 months. Now, now that the movement has eased off, have you guys gotten back to 2,000 rides? Right, um, not yet. We're around 1,817. Not yet. But the logistics is still... still no, no, we stopped that. Because oh, one okay. of the things, I'm not going to make that mistake again. We need to focus. Focus. Right. Uh, I need <laughs> us to focus on one thing. I mean, that was just a stopgap to mm -hmm. make sure we're still getting money into the system. But we're focused on one thing, and that is going to be bus service. Um, we expanded to Abuja. We have presence in Delta. Um, and we're looking at other things we can do, but everything focused on buses. I remember there was a news I saw, um, I think before the lockdown, yeah. that um, government was giving you guys troubles. How, how did you manage that? Um, we weren't given troubles. It okay. was people in the right hailing, um, right hailing, and that had to do with cars. Mm. That had so other platforms that were focused on cars. For us, one of the things we did was very early on, we approached government to start having conversations around right. um, uh, protecting our business and so we got um, um, bus hailing um, application sorted mm. very early on and then we also if you operate in bus in the bus space in Lagos you understand that there's another very important stakeholder called um, agros yes um, <laughs> um, and so these are people that I mean for the sake of people that don't understand those these are people that are co uh, monitoring the bus movement at parks yeah. in Lagos so we needed to be in the same um, place with them, and we got them on our side as well. So we, we sorted that out, and we so we had two stakeholders we were managing. We didn't just keep a blind eye to anyone, and that has helped us. So that has allowed us to expand our operations in Lagos easily. That has allowed us to, um, um, the resistance from them has been almost zero. Right. And, and, and they also, in fact, now they protect our interests mm. at the bus stop. So, that's it. the relationship has been good with with both the state governments and, and um, the, the, the local, <laughs> the, uh, the local key stakeholders. So you're yeah, CEO at Plenty Worker, right? Yes, I am. Okay, so why not? Why you not CEO at uh, Rent Small Small? How did that happen? It's like Let's you're building Rent Small Small as a totally different. Yeah, 
Because Plenty Waka and uh, Crowdinvest and Farm Crowd are all within the Enfato group. Mm. Um, Rent Super Small is it's a startup that, so I had the idea and then um, with um, Tunde, um, who's the um, MD yeah. there, um, and the other co-founder, and I allowed him to run that bit on his own. Um, I'm, I'm not sure yet about bringing it to the group. I just want okay. that to be separate. Why do? Why? Um, just to have something else that is not within the group. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 frankly speaking, there's no other reason. I just I wanted something completely different from the group. Let me focus on these ones. And the two is doing a brilliant job. Yeah. I mean, there are about 500 tenants that are paying rent on a monthly basis with yeah. rent small, small. And um, I, I'm excited about the growth they're having there. So I'm happy about the progress they're having. Um, in the future, they're looking at raising money and then growing the business. Um, that's so are you actively involved in the operations? Or you're just no, 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 at all. I, I'm not actively involved. I mean, once in a while, Tony will call me and say um, he wants to run ideas through me. Every idea, they will have to, we need to have our sessions. Right. We, consist, we constantly have those sessions to, to brainstorm around ideas, and then he goes on and executes. But I'm not involved in the day to day running. Amazing. So, has any of these other businesses raised money? Plenty Worker has Crowd raised money. Um, Plenty Worker has investors from Micro Traction to, to, um, to Enfato, the group, to Niche Capital. Niche Capital invested in, in Farm Crowdy. Mm. Um, and we also invested in Plenty Worker. And then Farm Crowdy has investors. Farm Crowdy has um, yeah. social capital, it has Texters, it has um, Cox Enterprise, it has GSMA, it has a couple of investors. Crowd Invest, on the other hand, Crowdinvest, the way it's been running, it's 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 been able to run its it's been able to um, operate on its own without mm. investment from outside, and mm. it's doing very well. So I mean, we see how far that can go. Yeah. Uh, but it's it's self-sustaining as um, today as a business. So excited about what Top Air is doing in that. Um, Rent Smosmo hasn't raised external funding yet. It's crypto right. game, personal funds that have gone into it. Um, but I think in the future it should be something really valuable. Interesting. So I mean, one of the key things that I really admire about your journey, how you build these businesses, is that you've moved with your team. So it's not just you founding or co-founding multiple companies, but you see how Topware has moved from Farm Crowdy to um, Crowdiverse. Yeah. Like everybody keeps moving. So. Yeah. What's the secret sauce behind how you've managed to build a team of people that even when new ideas come, you can say, you know what, just go manage this for us? Um, it's first believing that these people can also be entrepreneurs on their own and succeed. Mm. And knowing that I don't know everything. Mm. Um, um, how I select people that form my core team, I pay attention to that. I want to see that we have similar core values. Mm. Um, we're both we're hungry we're we're humble um, we're driven where there's a high level of um, emotional intelligence and in how you manage people because mm. I can see very relationship with a person just because of how he's managed um, the person beneath him or the person above him um, so I'm very very particular about um, um, emotional intelligence or, or being people smart mm. and and so these core values form the center of how I build my relationship with people. That's one. Two is I can find a talent today. I can find someone I feel I will work with in the future. And it will take me four years, five years, <laughs> six years before we'll do something together. But I just keep on keeping that relationship, mm. um, bearing in mind. This is how I find my co-founders. Mm -hmm. um, as against what I see today, someone goes to an event, an mm -hmm. idea pops up, he looks around, ah, this is my <laughs> co-founder because he has 20 years, 50 years experience in the space, I want to do something. You don't have any prior relationship with the mm. person. You're not friends. If things get tough, will he insult you and you take it so bad that you want to just take his head off? Mm. Or will you be able to drink over it? Will he be able to laugh over mm. it eventually in the future? Are you really friends? Um, these are core things that I pay attention to and I then find my co-founder. So in allowing them to then express themselves, when I look across the team, I see individuals that if they were on their own, building their own business, they would succeed. Right. So it's easy to allow them to do that. And then we're all learning. Mm. They learn a lot from me. I learn from them. Um, and in all the knowledge we share, we are able to express ourselves with the different um, ventures that we have. Interesting. Now, outside the 
core lesson you learned from Craig Gist, which mm. was focus, yeah. right? We raise money, stay on that post. What other core business lessons have you learned running from Crowdy and these other businesses? Um, that one, um, in addition to that, is if you look at what happened in Craig Gist, the reason why it grew from zero users to 200,000 users in the first six months was that customers appreciated the value we were giving them. We should mm. have just been improving on that. On that. Um, the customers, you have any customers that will tell you the direction your business is going. And mm. you should pay attention to that and not be too stubborn to say you would stick to, uh, this is what we say we will build, and this is what we will die day. with. Um, the customers can maybe point to you towards something else that you may add to what you've originally created. So uh, we pay a lot of attention to our customers and what they are seeing. Mm. We don't take everything they say and implement, but we take, I mean, we listen to what they are saying and try to find ways to, to tweak our model to continue to suit them. Because at the end of the day, you're building value for them. Yeah. Um, that's two. Three is, I've come to see that what we refer to as competition is not really the reason why a startup fails mm. or succeeds. Um, if you look at, if I give an example, um, there were two major e-commerce platforms in the country at one point yeah. in time. I'm not going to mention that. <laughs> but the reason why one of them eventually was sold wasn't because of customers. Mm. Um, it wasn't because of the competition. competition. Sorry. It wasn't because of co competition. There are many ag tech platforms in the country today. The reason why some of them have had issues is not because of competition. Mm. But many times as business owners, we pay a lot of attention to competition. Mm. You know, so I, one of the businesses I have learned is when you stay true to your core and you have your focus on your vision, just continue finding ways to innovate and get better mm. as a business. As against paying at so much attention to competition that you then find yourself in a place where it then looks like competition is responsible for driving every single thing that comes out of your business. Um, eventually, you get to a roadblock, and then uh, things will really be bad for you as a business. So, I, it's something I have learned um, over time in building my businesses. Um, I will. I'm aware of my competition. I don't take them for granted, but they are not the reason why I will do what I need to do in my business or craft a vision craft the mission and the reason why my business will succeed. Those are lessons I have learned from that. Then the last thing is, you can't do any, everything on your own. So one of the things I learned in, in Quickies was, I can't be the one making all the decisions. Right. I need a team. People. The team. The team is very, very, very important. And that's why I pay a lot of attention to who we recruit into the team. Have you made any hiring mistakes? Many. <laughs> I've recruited close to 600 people, so I've made many. Wow. Yeah, not in my company alone. I mean, like, yeah, just generally in all the other places. I've, so I've made many mistakes. And they've now fashioned how I now hire. So how do um, you now hire? What we do now is we, we f you first go to the recruit first stage of recruitment where your CV counts. Um, and then you come into the system, go through that phase. Then you go to the second phase where you're meeting most likely your peers right. and the people you've been reporting to. And at that point in time, it's not just about your CV, it's about your leadership skills. Mm. It's about your, your comp it's about your competence beyond what you've said in your CV. Mm. And then um, the last phase is, um, the last phase is on core values. Mm. And so we use our core values to then decide. You can be the best candidate, you can go through the leadership stage and you're fine. But when you get to the core values, if you miss out on any of them, then it's a problem. So, if you didn't raise money, you said it was hard to raise money at Farm Crowdy. Do you think that you guys would have survived? Mm, very interesting question. <laughs> <laughs> I think we would have found it difficult to survive. Because yeah. uh, at that stage of the business, um, we needed support. Um, when I support to get the right people on the team, or support to, because we're building, we're building a business that we had no, we had no template to follow. So everything was new, and we're taking risk on our own. We needed someone, we needed to support financially to make those mistakes, mm. learn from them, and then improve on the model. If we didn't have enough money to continue paying the salaries while making the mistakes, 
um, maybe we wouldn't have been where we are today. So I think it all came timely. Um, from the first fund from Niche Capital, we raised the first um, 60,000 to get into Techstars and then raising um, a million. I think everything came in time for us. So do you think then that, would you say it's important for most tech businesses to raise funds? It depends on what you're doing as a business. So um, software as a service businesses, most of them don't necessarily need to raise money. But it mm. depends on their model. Mm. Um, for a B2C business that needs to drive marketing to get customers, um, how else would you pay for the marketing yeah. that you need to do um, if you don't have funds? Except the business is generating revenue, but how much revenue would you generate that's enough for you to do the marketing mm. that gives the numbers that makes your business viable? So depends on the business. So I don't think there's any rule to say you must raise money or you shouldn't raise money. If your model allows you to get to a point where, for instance, I have Crowdinvest, for instance, that is in a place where the model allows us to make enough money to sustain that business and mm. it doesn't need to raise money. Fantastic. I mean, the more we can keep 100% of our business to ourselves <laughs> and we're making money, the better. Yeah. Um, but if you're in a place where you now need to do some level of marketing, if you're in a place where there's a lot of competition and there's no room for you to um, um, make mistakes and still survive, then you need to raise money. Because if you don't raise that money and you make those mistakes, you're dead. Yeah. What's your favorite city in the world? What? Your favorite city? Um, Cape Town. Why? The combination of artificial and natural beauty, mm. uh, the landscape and uh, the things I see there, um, every time I'm there, it's refreshing, it makes you calm. I love nature, um, so I just having a very good view of the Table Mountain and seeing the ocean, and uh, seeing the ocean, uh, it's, it's, it's beautiful. For me, it's just peace. Yeah. Um, um, so Cape Town. Thank you. What's your favorite color? Blue. Favorite food? Ah, there are many. <laughs> 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 um, I mean, farmers. So. Um, <laughs> So I like rice beans. I like I like pounded yam and different kinds of soup. Real pounded yam. <laughs> I pound what my own yam you? if I need to pound it. The real pounded yam. Um, and the you way you're emphasizing any, the real pounded yam. You can bring any kind yam. of soup. I'll do it with pounded yam. Um, yeah. So I have many that way. When you're not working, what what are we most likely to catch you doing? Either playing the keyboard at home, oh, you playing do. FIFA, very good with play, um, FIFA, PlayStation, or I am playing football. Um, so like football, you go like to a field? Like normal soccer, yeah. I oh. go to a field, I play. Oh, I play a lot. Play a lot yeah, you said that. I play a lot of football. It allows me to sweat and release stress. Mm. I do all the shouting on the pitch, and then I'm refreshed for the next day. <laughs> see all the shouting. Yeah, I, yeah, so if you don't see me walking, that's what you see me doing. If I'm not doing this, maybe I'm in church or something. Yeah. Do you ever take cereal? Um, so, let me know that. I have one cereal in my drive. I've been there for eight years. Ah, wow. So I don't really I was take going to cereal. ask you whether you do, you do um, cereal before milk or milk before cereal. Oh, when I do cereal, I do cereal before milk. Ah, uh, okay. You I, do I, milk I before really cereal. I really fancy you, but. No, that, that really breaks my heart. If you do cereal before milk, it allows you to still have the crispiness no, of the, the cereal. Milk, so the I milk helps crunch, you to know crunch. how much of the cereal to pour in. That, that's how it works. No, you like milk. I don't really like milk. Thank you. So this interview is over, guys. <laughs> because we, can't, we can't agree on this, unfortunately. <laughs> this last question. Yeah. What would you say to first-time founders? What would be your advice be? Hmm. First-time founders. Um, first thing I would say is depending on your age mm. gotta experience in a structured environment mm. gotta experience in an unstructured environment mm. before you start so if I'm 25 I would ask you if maybe you're 25 and you're just out of school and you want to be a founder the first time I would if I was going to advise you I'll tell you take an internship in a structured environment so a place that has maybe 20 50 years exp um, um, of operating yeah and then take another one in an unstructured environment ideally a startup that is still figuring its way 
then you'll be better equipped on how you will launch your business. Mm. That's one. Two, read good books. For me, good books are books of people that have failed mm -hmm. and books of people that have succeeded. Mm. And to every decision you have to make, there's a book for you to read. True. It helps me personally. Every decision I have to make, I'll find a book, I read about it, and then I make better decisions on what I need to do. So read, read books. Um, and the last thing, build very good relationships. Um, I won't advise anyone to start any business on their own. Okay. It's a very lonely road. Very lonely road being an entrepreneur and being an entrepreneur on your own. It would be good to have people that you can um, have conversations with. People that, and that's why it's important who you call your co founder. It's almost mm. like a marriage. Yeah, you don't want to just stumble on someone's tongue. You want someone that you have very good, strong relationship with that can take your shenanigans and take your good side and know the real you and they're ready to do what they want to do. Your, your, maybe your co founder may not be the one that has. 50 years experience but has the passion as much as you do right. but complements your skill you're good in marketing it's good in tech it's good with finance and you complement your skills together and then you make something happen thank you so much that was thank you very much this was an amazing interview guys i'm sure you know so please leave it in the comment section i think the one thing i'm going with is get experience read books and build really good relationships especially if you are first time a first time founder right yeah Awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much for staying to the end. If you're still to the end of this video, yeah, the real MVP, and I really appreciate you. Leave your comments below, share, leave some nice words for Yenka, leave some questions. He might just be passing through the YouTube channel and answer your questions. I don't know. <laughs> but thank you so much, and make sure you don't leave this channel without subscribing. See you another time. Peace out.